Hello everyone and once again welcome to Nature Life Online. My name is Christina and I'm going to be your host for today's show which is really really special. We'll be closing up biodiversity week and we have very very special guests but before we start let me tell you a little bit more about, about Nature Life. These shows used to happen at the Natural History Museum in London and we used to have big audiences there, but since the museum is closed at the moment, we can't go there. We decided to take the shows and bring them to your homes. Now, then the shows, we invite scientists to join us and talk about their passion and their work at the Natural History Museum. Um, and what is more important, the shows are live, so you can ask questions throughout the show. And we'll try and get through as many as them of them as possible through it. Um, but uh, without any further ado, let me introduce you to our guests today. We have two very, very uh, exciting guests. Uh, and the first one is the lovely Victoria Burson. Hi, Victoria. Good morning, Christina. How are you doing? I'm not too bad, thanks. Thank you so much for joining us today. And um, I don't want to uh, tell people what you do. I think it's better if you tell our audience what you do at the Natural History Museum. Okay, I've just finished my PhD, which is looking at the effect of uh, human activities such as growing food and growing um, forests um, on soil invertebrates, particularly earthworms. And as part of that, I ran a citizen science project. Um, that's when we asked the public to help scientists answer questions by collecting data for us. I'm now working at the Angela Marmont Centre for UK Biodiversity at the Natural History Museum, uh, which runs uh, citizen science projects and also the identification advisory um, service and various other things. That's brilliant. Um, that's an amazing, amazing job. And uh, again, when you talk to Victoria, you end up looking up, uh, at earthworms in a different way, uh, in general and all the things. Uh, but Victoria, we have another guest with us today to compliment you, um, and that is Tom McCarter. Hi, Tom. Hi. How are you doing today? Very well, thank you. Uh, so nice to have you both here. Tom, can you now tell us a little bit about your work at the Natural History Museum? Sure. Um, my background is horticulture and botany, so plants. Um, I manage the wildlife garden at the museum, which is a small corner hidden in the southwest corner of the NHM grounds. Um, so while it's a small little garden, uh, the museum scientists and staff have been recording wildlife and managing the habitats for wildlife for the past 25 years. And in that time, we've recorded uh, over 3,200 species, uh, different things, including some which are quite rare or an unusual, some records the, for the first records for Britain. Um, so in my role, I manage a team of staff and volunteers to care for the space and look after the habitats, but also to undertake some of the biological recording and to engage our visitors with the biodiversity, UK biodiversity. It's, and I think Victoria, you've, you've worked in that garden as well, after you've done some of your work there as well and participated in, in engagement activities there. I'm sure you both will uh, agree that the wildlife garden is a little, mm. little bit hidden jewel at the museum. And I think people really enjoy it when they, they visit it uh, because it's so rich and it just opened your eyes into the wildlife that is we'll talk about the wildlife in 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 the uk as well a bit more during the show this is what the show is about and that is why it's really really exciting but before that tom the the wildlife garden will undergo some changes in in general the the whole grounds of the museum in the future and isn't it yes so the earlier this year the museum launched the urban nature project um so the urban nature project aims to transform the museum's five acre outdoor space into a welcoming, accessible and biologically diverse uh, green space in the heart of London. Um, the project's gonna be undertaking some really interesting and groundbreaking uh, science, uh, which will in research into urban wildlife. Um, so things like environmental DNA and acoustic monitoring. Um, and there's also gonna be an extensive program of different activities that will help to engage uh, our visitors and also more broadly the public in the UK with uh, the importance of urban biodiversity. So it's a really <laughs> exciting project. 
It is. I think that's something to look forward to visit in the future once the, the museum opens uh, and they start changing all the time. It's, it's something that will be happening in the future, but it's really, really exciting. Um, now, that will help a lot at looking into the biodiversity, as you, you've mentioned uh, before. Some. And, and today, as I said before, we're going to be closing up the Biodiversity Week that we've been celebrating throughout this week. Um, at the museum, my colleagues have been putting out loads of activities that you could have done during the week and encouraging you to go out and send us pictures uh, of the nature that you saw. So we're going to be talking a little bit about that. We're going to be talking about nature at your door doorstep with these two experts that we have with us today, Victoria and Tom. I'm really excited about that. Now, one of the things that we suggested you could do is to start with was creating your own nature journal. Um, now, do you think a nature journal is, is really important to look at nature, Victoria? Yeah, so it's wonderful just to get outside and sit and observe nature but actually making a journal helps you kind of focus on those small details and it also keeps a record so it turns your observations into actually scientific information so we've actually learned quite a lot from uh, historical nature journals about how the changes um, in UK wildlife have happened over the last centuries. Mm -hmm. and, and that's it, it's, it's, having, it's leaving that record behind that then can be passed on, on to other people that might um, have a look at the same areas as you and then they can, you can compare data. Now, the first picture that we can see there is the journal that our colleagues from the digital team made uh, for their how-to video. So that's a, a video that you can check out if you want to make your own nature journal. But the other two images were done by scientists uh, The are really, really important. We're alive 150 years ago. The first one, the frog, is from Alfred Russett Wallace, who was uh, one of the people who contributed to the theory of evolution, um, as well as Darwin, which is the, the uh, journal that we see on the right, with his notes when he was thinking about the theory of evolution. So you can see how important those journals can be for future generations. Now, uh, Victoria, have you got your own journal? I have, yes, I've kept a nature journal since I was very little and I still, ha I still have the one I kept in the 1990s when I was about 12 or 13, uh, where I used to stick in uh, various leaves of plants and oh. sometimes do drawings and most importantly kept a record of things I saw um, and the date I saw them and where I saw them, so the basis of a biological record. And what about now? Do you have your own journal now? Yes, um, nowadays it tends to be a lot less exciting. You know, I just tend to write down everything I see. Um, <laughs> maybe I should go back to actually uh, taking time out to draw things I see or maybe sticking leaves again. <laughs> and what about you, Tom? Do you have a, a journal that you keep with um, what you see uh, later? I, I don't have anything as beautiful or as exciting as uh, Victoria's. <laughs> Um, but I do enjoy spotting nature and wildlife um, and taking photos, uh, sometimes using a, a cheap little macro lens if it's things like insects or flowers, small flowers. Um, but I, I upload these photos to some wildlife spotting apps, things like iNaturalist and iRecord. Um, and then you you have a list of a similar a list it is on, a, on an app or on your phone, but of your different observations. And I really, like being able to look back through them. Um, I find it helps me to learn their names um, and remember what they are when next time I see them. That's really, really cool. And I think it's important to remember that Darwin and Wallace didn't have a, a camera or a phone that could take. So that's something that we have now that can can help us as well to keep um, records of what we see. You don't, you know, you might not be very good at drawing, so then you can just take a picture or you can take a leaf like Victoria used to do and just put it in your journal. So uh, uh, as I said, we have a video how to do um, an extra journal. We posted it as well in the comments so you can have a look at that if you want to do that later. But let's get into the nitty gritty, the things that we can see, the things that we can spot. So let's start with um, animals, Victoria. What things, um, what animals are you always in the lookout for when, even when you look out of your window or if you go for a walk or, 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 a, or a, a round around your garden? Yes, yeah, so I can't go for a walk and see a log or a stone or a pot uh, without having a little 
turn it over and have a look what's underneath there. For me, it's like Christmas, a Christmas stocking opening. You kind of know what you're going to get, but you're never 100 percent sure. And so there's nearly always something to look at. Uh, wood lice, slugs and snails, beetles. And if you're really lucky, uh, you might even find newts and frogs under there. Um, but always remember to put the logs in back, back where you found them um, when you finished having a look. That's brilliant. Um, and in fact, we have a, a question coming from our audiences. Uh, uh, this is really, really good for right now. Um, Rose, uh, Rosie Cooper um, on Facebook, she's asking, what's your best tip for finding mini beasts? Uh, my cousin loves bugs, but there aren't many in the garden. Oh, well, one of the best things about um, mini beasts and um, vertebrates is I'm sure they are probably out there. I mean, that's what I love about um, insects and other invertebrates. They're kind of everywhere, but trying to find them can be trickier. One of my favourite methods for finding them, because it doesn't need much equipment, is called beating. So you just need a white sheet or tray or, so, or maybe even a white plastic bag would do and a stout stick. Um, pop your tray or... Um, sheet underneath some vegetation, some shrubs, trees, and then with the stick, give the plants a bit of a tap. And this just <laughs> dislodges things hiding in there onto the sheet. And because it's white, you can see them. Uh, they mostly be very small things. Um, so if you can only afford one piece of kit, I'd recommend a magnifying glass because it really opens up a different world there. Um, so have a, have, a, have, a, have a go with that. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, 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 there's a piece of little a bit of a patch of ivy in my garden, which I go out and have a tap every now often. And <laughs> it's amazing what you can find just in a few minutes. So I'm sure there'd be something out there. Right, brilliant. That's a really, really good advice for animals. But let's go to plants, actually. Tom, what are the plants that you're always on the lookout? And any highlights that you would like to tell our audience about plants that they might see? Yeah, I mean, uh, when I walk around, I think it's it's really nice to have a look at a close look at the different flowers and try to notice the differences between them. Um, I still find it really fascinating to look at the individual flowers that make up the head of the sunflower, um, or for that matter, lots of any other members of the daisy family. Um, and I think whilst you're examining the flowers, you can kind of sit there and watch out for all the different insects and invertebrates that might be visiting them because of their pollen and nectar resources. Um, so it's not just the familiar honeybees and bumblebees that you might see, but you might see flies or moths, um, beetles. So there's there's a whole range of different insects that will visit flowers. And I think that's uh, a really nice thing to see. I would second Victoria's point to try and find a magnifying glass because some of these things can be very small um, and having a magnifying glass brings out their, their details. Brilliant. Um, I would like to highlight that the last few pictures I was in were, Vict well, this one is Victoria's and the last mm -hmm. pictures with insects and flowers were Tom's. Um, and that proves that they are out there taking pictures and, and keeping the, the records. Uh, now, Victoria, you also mentioned when you look at insects, there's one particular kind of uh, insect that you like to see the interactions with. And I love that story. Can you tell us a little bit more about those little tiny green and black things called mm -hmm. the aphids? Yes, I love looking out for aphids when I'm out and there's lots this time of year and gardening groups would be full of things try, and trying to get rid of them, which I think is a real shame. Most of the time they don't do much harm. And if you just sit and watch them, it's amazing the interactions you can see. Often they're attended by ants, so um, aphids excrete a sugary substance called honeydew, which the ants actually milk from them. And in return, they protect them from their enemies because they have quite a lot of natural enemies, <laughs> including uh, ladybirds and ladybird larva and hoverfly larvae and also parasitic wasps. Uh, one of the ones on the screen there, which are all kind of uh, brown and crispy, we call aphid mummies. And that's what's left after a wasp has hollowed out the wasp larva has ho hollowed out the yeah, inside of the aphid. <laughs> That's brilliant. Uh, now we've got a lot of um, people asking, they're asking really, really wonderful questions. But one of the questions I'm asking is, how do you attract bees um, and butterflies to your garden? So I think this question is also is for both of you, Victoria and Tom. Tom, maybe we can start with flowers that you can plant to attract these kind of insects? Sure. So um, there's lots of different uh, flowers that will attract uh, insects and uh, butterflies to your garden. Um, the RHS has a great list of, 
a, a quite comprehensive list of uh, plants for pollinators. Um, and those plants don't have to be just native plants. They can be a whole range of different garden plants. Um, that, and some non-natives can help extend the flowering season in, in your own garden. But um, just plant a range of different flowers because different insects and invertebrates like different types of flowers. Um, I, th I think for butterflies in particular, we might be familiar with things like butterfly bush or buddleia, uh, which you often see growing around. Uh, butterflies do, that's a certain non-native garden plant, but butterflies seem to you know, love them. Um, so yeah, plant a range of different plants that will flower throughout the year at different times uh, with different shapes and sizes, really. Um, and Victoria, from the animal perspective, do you know about any particular animal that you know, yeah, this flower will definitely attract this, this particular bug, or is it a little bit more general, like Tom has said? Yeah, I mean, the main thing is to try and have a big variety of plants, and the more variety you've got, the more variety of insects you can get. But also, don't forget that insects are only adults for quite a small period of their lives. The rest of the time, they're existing as larvae and some of those are not always very popular with gardeners uh, caterpillars and things some eat our plants uh, but it's important to remember that if you want those adult insects in your garden you do have to tolerate um, some of the less uh, welcome habits of their babies so uh, I like to try and uh, think of it as that I'm sharing some of my garden with them and sacrificing a little bit of uh, food to them is I'm quite happy to do so in order to I can see the lovely moths and butterflies flying. This has been a bit more flexible and, and careful when we see yeah. those snails and the slides that we go, oh no, my flowers, it's okay. They also need uh, some things to it. That's that's really mm -hmm. bad you said, Victoria. Um, now I can see we've got loads and loads of questions, so we'll get uh, through as many as possible during the show. But I'd like to talk, talk a little bit about plants because I think we overlook them sometimes that everywhere you look out you see green but sometimes we don't look into them I think our viewers are quite aware that you know if you want to have insects you need the plants but can you tell us a little bit more about uh, plants that we tend to overlook and plants that you will tell people actually look for this one because you will never notice them yeah definitely I mean so plant we can refer to it sometimes as being plant plant blindness so you know, you tend to overlook plants that are very familiar to us. I think grass grasses would be a really good example of this. Um, so at a quick glance, they look very similar, you know, long linear leaves and they look grassy, but it's actually one of the largest, uh, largest families of flowering plants. And there's over a hundred species in the UK. So um, right now is actually a good time to have a closer look at them and see if you can notice the differences because they're flowering um, and setting seed. And you, you can tell the differences more easily when they're, when they're flowering. So have a look for the grasses and try and have a look and um, tune into those little differences between the plants and you, you, it'll help you to see different types. I think one, one key thing that I'm seeing throughout the questions is that we need to be attentive, we need to notice things, we need to uh, actually look carefully. What about using all the senses that are not our, our eyes? Can we, for example, Victoria, can we uh, listen to things? Can we hear any particular sounds that will help us notice nature around us? Yeah, something's actually easier to identify and monitor using sound. Uh, birds in particular, a common uh, method is just to stand in a spot and record the ones you can hear it around you. That's brilliant. Um, maybe we can have a look at some common uh, bear sounds um, and let's see if we can hear, um, if we can recognise any of the sounds because some of them are getting are really, really common and the moment you hear them you'll be like, oh yeah, I definitely heard that. So let's see if... Uh Hey, I've definitely heard that before. Can you can you recognise it by just the sound, Victoria? Yes, that's a lovely blackbird. Um, they're, oh. I always find they're particularly festing in the morning. That's one of the, <laughs> the lovely sounds. <laughs> that's brilliant. Um, let's let's hear a, a, another one. Oh, I've definitely heard that. Ah, so that one's a great tip. That's actually one of the particularly distinctive ones. It's often described as teacher, teacher. 
that's loud as well. That was brilliant. Uh, if you have had any of any of these uh, tweets, just let us know in the, in the comments. We would love to see that. But let's hear one more that has gone a little bit viral on TikTok, I think, recently. <laughs> I've definitely heard that in the morning. Oh, it's, uh, I don't listen to TikTok. Has that gone viral? Oh, apparently, yeah. People are saying this is this is what wakes you up every morning. Ah, okay. Uh, <laughs> yes, and the wood pigeons. Uh, yes, I suppose it can be quite monotonous and diary. I quite <laughs> enjoy it. I it's really know people, nice. Uh, it's really fun. nice, and and you would think, oh, that sounds a bit like an owl, but it's it's actually a, a wood pigeon, isn't it? Is a so with pigeons. Um, brilliant. So keep a, a, a near out next time that you hear these uh, these tweets and see if you can recognize them. Um, Tom, what about when I think about plants? We can't hear the plants really, except for the rustling of, of uh, leaves and so on. But we can smell them, can we? Uh, yeah, there's lots of us would be familiar with um, the strong smells that you might associate with roses or mint or lemon rosemary, things like that. But many plants are packed full of, you know, oils and uh, compounds that produce scent. Um, so scent can be quite an important uh, characteristic for helping us or tool for helping us identify plants. And it's sometimes something that you might you'd want to write down on a herbarium sheet if you're collecting plants, um, because it's something that won't come through. So you need to record those mm -hmm. types of details. Um, and yeah, I mean, plants, there's a huge variety of scents and smells out there. My favorite are things that smell like rotting meat to attract pollinators. Um, lots of members of the Arum family do this. Uh, I have one in my garden called Drapunculus. Um, and <laughs> fascinating when they flower and it's just, I mean, they're, they're smelly, but it's, uh, it's just so cool. So I really like those. Brilliant. Um, we have a, another question from our audience, from Henry H. Uh, H. Uh, what is the flower that bees like the most? And I'm asking this because maybe the, the smells have something to do with, with that. Tom, do you, do you have a certain answer? Is there one plant that bees go, that one, that's my favourite? Uh, depends, I guess, that would be <laughs> a question. Um, some plants are very tricky. There are plants uh, like bee orchids that will produce a pheromone or a scent that will attract mm. and trick it into pollinating. Um, so look out, we have some species of bee orchids uh, in, 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 in the UK. Let's look out for those. There's also lots throughout the Mediterranean. Um, but generally plants, you know, a, a lot of plants are more uh, general than that. And they'll, the bees will go to lots of pollens to collect lots of different pollen and nectar. And they actually need the variety to, you know, mm -hmm. be healthy. So um, usually it's plants tricking bees uh, for specific reasons. Brilliant, thank you so much Tom. Now we were talking a little bit about senses and I, that makes me think about when we, uh, if, if it's dark and we can see it, so what we can spot at night because nature doesn't go to sleep as we do at night. So there's still a lot that we can spot at night. Um, what sort of things can we can we see and, and spot when, when twilight comes, Victoria? I like uh, going out and about with a torch at night, especially on a quite warm, damp night, because you often get see things you don't see during the day. Earthworms in particular often pop their heads out of burrows at night and you'll find slugs and snails crawling over them. And of course, you, you could even build a light trap and have uh, insects come to you. Um, so the simplest way to do that is just put up a white sheet and have a bright light on it or UV light in particular is good. Or you can make more... Um, elaborate traps which actually um, catch the moths safely inside for you to look at in the morning and then look at and release when you've finished identifying them. Mm -hmm. So the the two different uh, pictures that you saw, the one was the, the very DIY uh, light trap that you can make with just um, uh, a light and a, a white sheet of uh, fabric but then the second one uh it was done by both of them were done by one of our scientists um gavin Brode, uh, and it was it's, it's a bit more um it's a bit more elaborated it also works the same way it's just a light um and 
in the white sheet. And if you want to know how to make your own one, the simple one, you can also check out a video that, that we made with Gavin and you can see him uh, doing and how you, you can spot different things. Um, and that is really, really nice. Now, sounds, I suppose, can also help us um, at, at night time. Yes, so most uh, urban uh, livers will be familiar with the sound of foxes um, in the winter time, making their various mating calls and sometimes wakes you at a night, occasionally frightens people. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe, maybe we can hear. There they are. <laughs> Okay, bye, bye, Mr. Fox. <laughs> um, but there, there are all the things. Make me think, for example, of um, bats or owls that might be awake um, at night. And I love the story that you told me about owls that have the female and the male have different uh, songs, don't they? Yes, yeah, the classic twit twoo of the tawny owl is actually two birds. It's the female calling the twit part and the <laughs> male uh, calling back the who. Hear those. That's the female. That's the female. And that's the male. That's really. They do a duet. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Now we've getting so many questions from our audience. I thought uh, let's get through um, a few of them. Um, I love this one from Zoe and Rachel, five and seven. Uh, they're asking, they know they have two ladybird larvae and they have made cocoons. I think that's really cool that they've been able to spot that. How long until they turn into ladybirds? Victoria, I think that question. Ooh, I'm not actually sure how long it takes. I don't think it takes very long. Certainly I watch them in my garden quite a lot and it never seems more than a week or two before Ooh. the cocoons hatch out into ladybirds. One thing it would be nice to look out for is when they first hatch out, they haven't got any spots. So that actually colours up <laughs> later as their uh, wing cases harden. So have a look out for that. You might even be able to make a little nature journal showing how they change as they emerge. It's the sort of thing I used to do when I was young. <laughs> And uh, uh, we've got a couple of questions for you, Tom. Uh, this one I particularly like. It might be a bit difficult, so don't worry if you don't know exactly the one. But it says, uh, so Finn, age 10, he's asking, which grass is the longest? Ooh, well, I think that would probably have to be one of the tropical bamboos. So um, we don't have them in this country, but species like Dendrocalamus, I believe it is, can grow absolutely huge. Um, and they're often used, well, they have been used for construction. Some of the, the stems of the grasses can be absolutely massive and very strong. So I think that would be uh, a bamboo. That's brilliant. Um, and another question for Victoria. Uh, YouTube, uh, a person on YouTube is asking us, uh, were they saying that they've put bird boxes everywhere in their gardens, but they're not getting any birds? Have you got any tips for them? Is it oh. Yeah, I mean, if you've only put them up recently, they, they can take a little while to get settled in and so the birds know that they're a safe place. Um, it's also worth looking at about uh, what aspect you have them at. Um, birds often need a particular um, facing, uh, whether it's north, south, east, west, I'm, I can't remember off my head, um, but to make sure it's the right temperature for the nestlings. And the RSVB website has quite a lot of advice on the best sort of sightings for nest boxes. Um, different birds need different heights as well, so it's worth having a look on there and making sure you've got them positioned in the right places in your garden. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, that's really, really good advice. Uh, now, uh, Victoria and Tom, I'd like to go back to, we've been talking a lot about animals and insects, but I'd like to go back to to plants and the, the sort of plants that we can spot on our daily walks. If you if we go out in our neighbourhood, Tom, uh, what plants would you tell people that they will expect to see and which ones would you recommend to, to spot? Well, there, there's all sorts. Um, if you're in an urban area like I am in London, um, you'll see a, a huge diversity of uh, ornamental uh, and often non-native plants in people's gardens. Um, and out and about, maybe between people's houses or next to the railway tracks, you'll see you know, a mix of species that are able to colonize that kind of disturbed land. So 
Again, near me, I have things like sycamore, which is this tree here, um, but I also have things like buddleia or green alkanet, herb robert, bindweed, um, plant, plants like that, those. You might, you know, people would often say they're, they're weeds, but they can be really important for biodiversity and, and uh, urban areas uh, increasingly recognized as being important for wildlife. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but it, it's important to note that even in urban areas um, like London, it can be quite easy to reach not, uh, natural or semi-natural habitats. So just this past weekend, I was on Wimbledon Common, which is, you know, quite close to very in the centre, you know, very close to central London. And it's got large areas of woodland and heathland habitats. So make sure you try and get out of your local area and, and see what you can find. That's really lovely. And I love that there are plants that, you know, you see them everywhere. So you expect them to be from, from the UK native from here, uh, but they just, they're not, but they just have be around and they just reproduce and keep growing. Yeah, um, lots of been, plants have been brought to the UK um, by well many gardeners and some of them <laughs> just colonized a, a niche or a habitat that they, that they, that they find um, good. And some of those are, you know, uh, are fine and some of them become problematic in times and it's uh, watching those um, and recording them is some of the sci interesting science that you can do because we need to record how these plants are spreading um, and see if they're having any detrimental effects. Mm -hmm. um, and, and sticking to, to plants and recording and looking at them, uh, we have uh, Michael asking us or asking yourself maybe, Tom, what is the best way to preserve press flowers or leaves? Have you got any tips for that? Um, yeah, so, oh, the, I mean, when I was, I've, I've done this before, um, actually having a, a nature journal, if you want to press plants, I mean, you can simply press a flower or some leaves and press it in a big stack of books. So put it in between some books and some newspaper in some newspaper and then put heavy books on top and leave it in a, a dry environment um, and come back after a few weeks and you'll have a squashed and dry plant. Um, <laughs> uh, if you want to get a bit more technical, you can buy smaller plant presses or make them yourself out of some plywood and some screws. Um, and I find it absolutely fascinating. It's more or less the same technique that, you know, botanists and uh, you know, scientists who are going out and studying plants around the world are still using the same techniques of, uh, you know, squashing and drying plants. And it's really important to realize that that technique is, is really valuable. Um, it becomes mm -hmm. a point in, in time and, and shows a record of that plant. So, um, yeah, they get some newspaper and some put a plant between and put some heavy books on and you will end up with a herbarium pressing. Yeah, and I suppose you can do them just to do, I don't know, things that you can hang on the walls, but you can also do it scientifically if you just take a couple of notes of where you found it, how it looked. On Yeah, definitely record, uh, you know, what it is, if you know what it is, where you found it, uh, when you found it, and your name on the, on the, on the sheet, and that becomes a, a record. <laughs> and also you any additional things like scent that you might have seen. Um, <laughs> I think one of the oldest uh, collections that we had at the museum are pressed plants. So that's how, how important and how long they can last. I think 500, 400 years old over there. So that's really, really cool. Um, now, uh, <laughs> we, have, we actually have a video of how to press plants. So uh, we're going to try and put it on the chat. So if anyone wants to see um, a, a more practical view of it, you can have a look at that as well. Um, but um, Victoria and Tom, one of the things that we've uh, been uh, we've been talking about is how to ID a species. Now, you two are experts, obviously. So I suppose for you, relatively easy to look at something and know what it is, or is it not that straightforward? Uh, well, it depends uh, really what group it's in. In some groups, uh, there's relatively few numbers of species uh, mm -hmm. and quite a lot of good uh, resources out there to identify them. For birds, for example, the RSBB website has some really good um, information on how to identify birds and for what they look like, but also has recordings of the different sounds they make. Um, mm -hmm. The Mammal Society has uh, various different um, information packs on all the UK mammals. 
Um, and also on the signs they make, often you never see the mammal themselves, but you do find their droppings or their footprints, and they have guides there to identify from that. The animals I'm mostly interested in, the invertebrates, are a lot harder because we've got over 30,000 different ones in the UK. And so uh, it's just quite get upset that I wouldn't be able to identify anything to species. But <laughs> I've come to realise that no one can. And that's OK. I mean, often it's fine just to start out and find out what the major group of your um your insect or invertebrate is in. So is it a spider? Is it a bug? Is it a beetle? And then uh, once you've got down to that, it might be in one of the more easily identifiable groups, such as butterflies. And there'd be lots of resources out there on, for example, the Butterfly Conservation website, how to identify it. And other resources for more tri tricky groups, like the uh, Angela Marmon Centre's uh, Identification Advisory Service. So even though the museum is closed, they're still taking inquiries via email and Facebook, helping people identify the wildlife they find in the UK. Or you could upload your photographs to iNaturalist, and that's what people all over the world can help um, help you identify your finds. That's really brilliant knowing that the Angela Mammal Centre is still working mm -hmm. from home and, and answering your questions. So, yeah, it's it's really exciting to be able to send that and have that support. What about plans, Tom? What would you, uh, what tips would you give any buddy naturalist when it comes to identifying plants? Yeah, um, I think. Start to learn the different groups and the different families. Um, start with things you might know, like the grasses or the daisy family. Um, and then you can use that as a, as a, you know, to delve a bit deeper with some uh, guides or handbooks. Um, the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland has some really good plant identification guides and some handbooks um, and plant crib sheets. Uh, so there's lots of information out there and there's different books on different subjects. So if you're particularly interested in trees, you might be able to find a book specifically on trees or if it's wildflowers, there's also good resources on wildflowers. Um, Trellis can also help identify plants. And I think for both plants and animals, um, it's really good to meet others who have similar interests and, and learn from others. I, I found that particularly valuable for myself. Um, and that could be, you know, different Facebook groups. Um, uh, there's things, you know, there's a there's a flies group on there's different plants on Facebook, um, and that can be really important. Um, but also maybe join in a society uh, like a natural, your local natural history society. Um, so can we, just meeting others with similar interests can be really important to them. I love that it's it's all about uh, community and people helping each other when it comes to identifying. So we don't, nobody has all the knowledge inside of them and it's all about collaborating and talking to each other and asking each other, oh, what do you think this is? That's really beautiful. Definitely. And that's true in the scientific community as well. There's a lot of discussion around, you know, uh, what what different things are and we need to communicate to kind of learn about the world around us. So. Mm -hmm. Um, we had a question, actually, I thought I'll ask this now, but we had a question uh, at the beginning of the show uh, from Jasper, um, who is six, and he actually wants to know how many insects are there in the world? And there are loads, aren't there, Victoria? Oh, gosh, yes, I didn't look up in the world, but yeah, <laughs> it, it's a huge number. They're by far the biggest group of uh, all the uh, animals across the world. <laughs> Is more than any mammals, any, any. Yes. Well, in fact, um, uh, there's more flies in the UK. So 7,000 different flies in the UK than there are mammals in the entire world. So oh, wow. this gives you an idea of the scale of insect diversity. <laughs> That's really brilliant. Uh, now, Victoria, we had another question for you. This one is a little bit tricky, but I thought I'll ask you because I think, you know, um, not everyone is so keen on slugs and aphids as as we could be. Um, so uh, Elizabeth is asking us, because she's not um, that keen on slugs and aphids, and especially when they attack the plants, is there any way to deter them while maintaining their biodiversity? So maybe not killing them necessarily. Is there any tricks that you know that might help her protect her flowers, but also protect the biodiversity in her garden? My main 
thing to deal with slugs is to mostly grow things they don't like, which doesn't always work because often they're things that I like to eat as well. Um, but sometimes they can be success using sacrificial plants. So you plant something they particularly like, or I, I once used to put out some old cereal for them and they ate that and left my lettuces alone, which worked quite well. So just <laughs> them. Um, so that can work. And barrier methods, um, people have tried things like eggshells and um, wool mulches. Um, there's some debate on whether it works. Some people have had success, others haven't. I think it depends a little bit on your situation. But yeah, uh, yeah some things can be a bit hard to live with. Uh, <laughs> but I always like to think of it as those neighbours that you know you need to get along with for the sake of the <laughs> kind of wider anniversary but they might not always be good to stick around but yeah sometimes having sacrificial plants and fooding does help keep them away from the things you really want that's brilliant um let's see if we can have on the screen the slides with the website that people can check because we've getting a lot of um questions tom and victoria about what resources we can use to identify plants in our gardens or um animals around us so there's many uh websites that people can can check on and um i particularly like the ones that we can help but i i, I would like to highlight again the angela marmon center uh, at the Natural History Museum, it's a centre for biodiversity um, and they help uh, people from around the UK to identify different species and they're still working now so you can uh, look them up um, and have a look at them. Let's see if we can put a link to the um, Angela Marmon Centre website there so people can, can get help from them. Um, but there's also a, a lovely question about those plants that I love but loads of people don't love that much that are nettles. Tom. <laughs> What is, what is it in nettles that make us itch? And that's a question from Henry Eight and Ethan, who's also eight. Ooh, that's a very good uh, question. Um, I don't know exactly, exactly what the compound is, but they have little kind of needles on their leaves that filled with uh, a, a compound that when it pierces your skin will make you itch. Um, and this is something that if you observe closely, you can actually you can actually see them. So I would recommend getting a magnifying glass, possibly some gloves and staying carefully away from them um, and, and have, a, have a look. Um, it's not just nettles that employ this technique. There are other plants that have uh, cells that are full, filled with kind of compounds that deter predators. Um, some of them can be much more painful than the nettle we have in this country. So. Um, and nettles are also brilliant for lots of biodiversity. They're used as a food plant by different caterpillars um, and different insects. So um, it's it's good to you know respect the nettles in your garden. Um, maybe have a have a place where you can let them grow a bit and um, yeah. <laughs> Stay clear. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much, Tom. Now, we're getting to the end of our show. We'll be wrapping up soon. But I didn't want to finish the show without having a look at some of the pictures that um, our viewers, our, our followers on Twitter have sent us um, that they've seen during this biodiversity week. Um, so let's see if we can have uh, some of them. And uh, let's see if you guys have any ideas of what they are. Victoria, can you um, spot uh, what this is over here? This, little oh, this is a fledgling, a robin, I think. I get more than blackbirds muddled up. <laughs> Tom agrees, do you? Robin yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they're just wow. emerging at the moment. So, <laughs> so is it a young robin? You it's a young robin. robin. Yes, they oh. don't get their, their red breast until a bit later in the year when they first uh, fledge. So, first get their flight feathers. Uh, their <laughs> record. That's brilliant. And we have some people from um, our school as well, uh, the bio biology class sending us some pictures as well. So let's see if we can have a look at some of them as well. They've sent some uh, birds. Can you, they're a bit far away, but they're beautiful pictures. Can you spot what they are, Victoria? Is it a bit tricky? Uh, yeah, I had a little look closer up earlier and uh, uh, I was, there was lovely, some lovely heathland gorse there. Uh, reminds me of some of the places I did my field work. Uh, but I believe we have a, a linnet and a stone chat there. They're both females and they've got beaks full of insects as well. So I imagine they're collecting insects for their collections. <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, and they also sent us some uh, pictures of some insects. So let's have a look at them. Ah, lovely. Or oh, a ladybird. 
<laughs> yeah, so <laughs> it's actually, that's one of the ladybirds. It's actually a 16 spot ladybird. So it's a uh, cream and black rather than the more familiar red and black. Uh, those ones actually don't eat aphids. Not, not all ladybirds do. These ones are mold eaters. So you oh. find them, often find them on mildewed plants. Oh, and that's then, good. <laughs> and in the middle, we've got a, a true bug of some sort. Uh, I'm not sure which one that is. That's one of the ones I would have to uh, give to a colleague to identify more. And on the, <laughs> on the end, end there, a little beetle, which I think is one of the leaf beetles. But then again, that's another group where there's a lot of little small brown things. And unless you can look very closely at them and have seen a lot of them to know the differences, it can be hard to go further than that. Brilliant. And we have some uh, flowers as well sent by our, our viewers over there. Well, we have an, a big nest in the centre. Um, but actually, the one on the right is one of my favourite flowers ever. But um, we, I can see a thistle of some kind of there. Tom, it's a bit far as well, that one. Yeah, it's a thistle. I, I don't know exactly which thistle it is. <laughs> um, it's a member of the, the Asteraceae or the daisy family. Um, so the same family as sunflowers that I mentioned earlier. Um, so there's a few in the uh, a, a few different genera of thistles that could be. I don't know exactly which one it could be an mm. but um, yeah. <laughs> but at least we, we the group the big group the thistles. Yeah, <laughs> and that's really how you start to identify things. Is you you start broad and then you work out what it is and then you narrow it down. So if I had a guidebook, then I would look up the daisy family section and then you can flick through and you might find something that's similar. You could also use a key, um, a biological key at this point and you um, start, it's a question and answer path to try and help you identify a different species. So species. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and the, the white flower on the right, that also as, as the asteraceae, so the sunflowers and the thistles, they are flowers made of loads of little flowers, aren't they? And this one is also one of them, isn't it? Yeah, so this is, uh, this is in the carrot family, where well, this is, uh, by the looks of it, to be a wild carrot, so carota. Um, and uh, also known as the, the apiaceae or the umbelliferae, they have a, a head of, uh, in, a, in a distinctive kind of um, urn shape, I'll say, um, and with a head, and the flowers are often white. These ones have, uh, Dorcas carota have a, a little red bit in the middle which can help with their identification. Um, <laughs> a lot of different members of the APAC that look very similar and some are edible. You know, we're familiar with carrots um, or parsnips, uh, but there's quite a lot that are quite poisonous as well. Um, in fact, going back to the nettles, uh, some of the APAC have compounds on there and that can be uh, irritate your skin as well. So look out for giant hogweed, which is a non-native plant in the UK that can cause severe reactions if you go in the sun. So um, be careful around the EPAC because there's <laughs> lots of different ones, um, but they can be very valuable and they're very valuable for wildlife. Uh, lots of different things visit them. That's brilliant. So thank you everyone for sending your pictures through and I hope that you like our, our little identification technique. Now, Sally, we've reached the end of the show. I feel we've got, I've got so many more questions for you too, but I'm so glad that the Angela Mammal Center is still open and the, uh, when the museum opens back, I'm sure people will keep in touch and, and come visit the wildlife garden. Um, so Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom and Victoria, for joining us today for this wonderful uh, Nature Live. I really hope that everyone um, had uh, seen a little bit how easy it is to support uh, wildlife just outside of your window. Uh, but I'm going to say goodbye to you both and hopefully see you in the future. Bye, guys. Mm -hmm. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Brilliant. Um, and thank you as well to all our viewers for watching, but also for sending your wonderful questions, sending us your wonderful pictures as well. It's been a pleasure uh, to uh, interact with you during this show, um, which we're using to close Biodiversity Week. And as I said before, I really hope that you've um, this show has opened your eyes into the, the wildlife that is just at your doorstep. Um, it was a pleasure to be with you. Um, but 
this is not the last Nature Live. We've got loads of Nature Lives coming up. And remember, they happen on Tuesdays at 12 p.m. and on Fridays at 10.30. And we've got two really exciting ones, um, exciting ones coming next week. On Tuesdays, we'll be talking about crocodiles from the past and from the present. And on Fridays, we'll be looking into the bat rep that have killer whales and how that bat rep is not fair to those amazing animals so remember tuesday at 12 and um, will be crocodiles uh friday at 10 30 will be killer whales uh but from uh this time i'm going to say goodbye to you and see you on the next nature life i'm christina bye <laughs>